Well, I had a little talk with someone today who, who is wants to overcome pain. Uh, so many people think everything falls from the sky. What God taught me about pain is the same thing he taught me about food and everything else. And one of the things he taught me was you can run for prayer. You can take drugs. You could do anything you want to get out of that pain. But there comes a time, perhaps in your life, and maybe it'll never come. Just in case it does come, perhaps it'll come to a place where there won't be anybody to run to to pray. There won't be anybody around that will be able to help you. There won't be uh, there won't be anything there to help you. There will be no medicine, nothing, just you and Jesus. So God taught me to resist pain, to take authority over it in the sense of commanding my body to listen to God. And like I said, there was a PA that told me she would never forget what I had told her, that our bodies have to obey the Holy Spirit in us. And what I never had a chance to tell her is, is it's like uh, practicing. In the beginning, it's very, very difficult. Sometimes you endure and suffer the most excruciating pain. And, it, and there's no sin in taking the medicine. There is no sin in taking the, uh, the drug if you need it. Because pain, from what I understand, when I had it, is something the doctor told me that once the pain gets real bad, nothing will help it. No matter how much medicine you take, nothing will take it away. Something happens to the body and, and nothing will take that pain away. So, anyway, I think my yawning comes from talking and not breathing while I talk. Because I'm not the least bit tired. So I can remember years ago, I can remember <laughs> there were times I'd get tired and I would stumble and I would smack my, my foot into something. I don't know if it was a chair leg or a table leg or something, something sometimes sharp that would cause my toe to bleed and make it feel like it was broken. And then I decided I wasn't going to put up with this anymore. Just like so many other things, I had to get to a mindset of saying, no, whatever it is that causes this, it's done. It's finished. Because I remembered the word it said that he will give, if you set your love upon him, he will give his angels charge over you that they will bear thee up lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Well, when they bear thee up, they lift you up before it happens. But <laughs> he's always healed me after it happened, not meaning that he didn't stop it because, boy, there were so many miracles that he intervened that even people could testify to that God intervened, that the hand of God was there or the angels were there. <laughs> like my husband had told everybody, he said, you know, my, my wife always said that when she drives, the angels go with her. And... And I want you to know it is true. <laughs> I didn't learn how to drive till I was 42, and he learned 
how to drive when he was like real young, a teenager. So <laughs> I guess to him, mine had a lot to be desired. But it was true. God's angels went with me and protected me. <laughs> and, uh, and so I remember the day I I hit my foot the hardest that I've ever hit it. And the pain tried to come. And immediately I said, no, you will not come. In the name of Jesus, this toe will not hurt. And so the pain left. It did not come. It didn't bleed. It didn't break. It didn't anything. So then I did it again. It's same thing. Instantly, it started practicing with God. It started just being instant. And, uh, wow, I can tell you that, oh, so, so many times that, uh, that he would heal me. And I mean, instantly, not, not 10 minutes later, not five minutes later, instantly. Because I believed what he said. He said, if I set my love upon him, that he would take care of me, that he would bless me. And I, oh, I believed that with all my heart. And the evidence of it was when I would go through things, like the, the impact of that, uh, I was going about 35 miles an hour, and the road was closed. And as I was entering into the part of the road that was open for me, I was going 35, and this woman was going 45. That's a 75 mile an hour, hour impact head on collision. And uh, I jumped out of the car. I ran to make sure the people in the back were okay. And see all of these people that knew me are watching me. And they're going, man, your adrenaline was flowing. No, God was with me. I had no concern about my body or myself. My greatest concern was, is somebody else hurt? And uh, so somebody called the, uh, you know, paramedics. And I'll never forget this. They shoved me back into the car and they uh, locked me in a seatbelt and it cut me out which I never understood. And then after they did that, they took me and strapped me on a board and put that big, you know, styrofoam thing on your neck. And I'm going, get me out of here. I don't need this. I feel good and I'm struggling to get out of it. And the one paramedic turned around and he says, lady, if you don't lay still, Tomorrow, you wouldn't believe the pain you're going to suffer. Because every movement after an impact that severe, you're, you're going to have trouble. Well, I didn't pay any attention to him because I knew better. I knew that by tomorrow, I was going to be okay. I'm not concerned. So <laughs> the next day, I saw them at a store called One Stop Shopper. And they were all the same exact paramedics were in there. And I went into the store laughing. And I'm dancing around them, you know, and moving my body the way I said I never, never could. And I'm laughing. I says, look what Jesus can do, <laughs> you know. And I'm praising the Lord and letting them know. I says, so I'm not going to be able to move, huh? <laughs> oh, that was so much fun. The shock on their face because... You know, just like the shock whenever I went blind and, and my uh, doctor 
saw a picture of what I could draw. <laughs> I mean, he almost cried because he knew how bad my eyes were. There was no way I could do that, but I did. And just like when I broke my wrist and I said, the doctor said that this bone broke into this bone and then it looked like this. And then he shook because I had no cast. And I says, I didn't need it. And just like when the, when the doctor says that I had a fall and I hit a, a nerve in my leg and every, every one of my nerves were going to, uh, uh, in that leg, I, it, it, I, I would ruin them so bad if I walked on it without a, a crutches that what would happen is, is I would, uh, it, it would uh, destroy every nerve and I'd never walk normally again. And uh, I took the crutches. I just got angry at it and I took the cr crutches and I threw them. And I took my foot and I slammed it as hard as I could down on the ground. I just lifted up my foot and just went like that. And just before it hit like that, that second it was instantly healed. And then it touched the ground. Just like the many times that when I had to exercise and walk and the pain was so excruciating in my ankle and my arch and every step said you can't do this you're not going to walk and every step in the name of Jesus you will obey God I will walk so foot you better listen in the name of Jesus and about the fourth time that I healed and towed it pain left Just like the time that, that I was so busy, I had no idea that uh, I was making French fries and the, um, the oil was boiling, bubbling. I forget what I was doing because I really wasn't thinking. I was probably working with someone and I put the, the potatoes in and all four of these fingers laid in that boiling, bubbling grease oil. And I pulled them back out and I looked, nothing, no pain, nothing, and I could wipe off the oil. I don't know if you know anything about an oil burn, but if you, if you actually get burned with oil, in, until that oil cools off, you're in excruciating pain. There was nothing. I can remember standing too close to a um, pressure cooker, not even knowing how it worked and stuff and standing there. And I forget what I did that released it. And the pressure of the steam hit this part of my arm. And as fast as it went down like that, that's as fast as it was healed. I mean, I'm, I'm watching it because... Just like that. Because God's word is true. I've said this so many times. When I went to Mexico and I preached, I told them the messages he said had nothing to do with me. I couldn't do that. I said, do you think that I'm healed like this because I read my Bible every day? Because you'd be wrong. Do you think that I, I'm healed like this because I'm so holy and so much above everybody else? You would be wrong again. Do you think that it's because I did this or I did that or I said this or I said that? You'd be wrong. And I'd smile. And I tell him, you said I would be healed. That's why I got those healings. You said I was going to live and not die. And I would declare the works of the Lord. It wasn't because of me. It was because you said, you said 
that if I smashed my toe. Now, the last, <laughs> I'd say, couple problems I had with my toe. My husband had something fall on his toe that was very heavy. And he got a big hematoma on his toenail. He was in pain for just about a year. It didn't, it, 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 did, it took about a year to completely heal. And he was in pain for about a year. And so when we were in the kitchen together and I was pulling something out of the refrigerator that was a square block of something that was as solid as ice. And I reached up like this, so it, it, it was pretty high in that freezer. And I reached up and it fell and it hit my toe in the exact same spot that whatever it was hit his. And he just, oh, Marion, that's going to be so bad. It's going to look at mine. It's still not completely well. You're going to suffer. You're going to everything. Oh, my goodness, you just don't know what's going to happen to your toe. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, no, Bob, you're wrong. That's not going to happen to my toe. And I picked up up of my foot and I said look and I'm wiggling my toes I said I'm not going to suffer any pain and nothing is going to happen to this toe it's healed, God healed it he saw it again a second time and then just recently about six months ago we had bought a china closet and the bottom half of it weighed about a hundred pounds and, and we're right there together, and the bottom half of it didn't have any legs on it. So when it came down, it, it slammed down. If we let go at the last second, it, it would slam down. And that means a 100-pound impact. And I forgot. I didn't have my shoes on. And as it went down, I mean, to his shock, my bare toe is under that. And instantly he reached up, but I could see the toe was crushed, but it instantly came back when he lifted it up. Did I pray? Did I run and beg God? I say, oh God, help me. You're going to have to heal this toe. I don't know what. Was there any time? Was there any moment? Was there anybody to pray for me? Was there anybody on the scene that could change that? Now, I'm not telling you every single problem I had was healed because there were times God wanted me to go through something. I had to learn. There were times God wanted me to take medicine, and I had to take it because it took as much humility to obey him in that way as it did to receive him in the other way. And whether he heals you through a doctor or through an operation or through medicine, whichever way he does, it's all a miracle. It's all him. He taught me that in the very beginning when I would resist the pain. And I can remember the pain being so excruciating in my head. And I would fight it. And God would say, stop. Marion, take the pill now. Take a pain pill now. There's no sin in doing that. You don't have to resist to the death and die of pain. Go ahead, take it. And when you get better, you tell that enemy to get his filthy hands off of you. You tell that to him. And I did. When I got better, says, it ain't gonna, it's not going to happen to me again. You're not going to get me in that position. And whenever I would get close to death, because I could feel the times that my body would slip out and God would slip back in. And the, you, you, when you slipped out, you could feel all the pain and everything that you felt in your body was 
back there. And here you were coming out of it. And he would just gently put me back in. He didn't speak. He didn't have to. Him and I both knew it wasn't my time. So I knew the times that I would get real close to that slipping out. And I would say, Lord, is it my time? And he would say, no, Marion, you've got a lot of work to do. I, I want you to speak to a lot of people. And I'd go lay my head down and I could see book after book after book. Me. While he was saying, you have a lot of work to do. Well, that was probably when I was about 75 or 78. That So I knew immediately, as soon as he said that to me, no, I knew, it. you know, I knew it was him. So I just sat up and said, get your filthy hands off of me, Satan. I'm going to live and not die. I will declare the works of the Lord. Many times in my life I went through this. Not just one, not ten, not twenty. You figure I'm going to be 81 years old. That's a lot of years to live. Fifty years of being with God, trusting in him for the little things so that he could teach me how to overcome with the big things. And if you can't overcome for the little things, how are you going to ever believe God for the big yeah. things? That's what he taught me. He taught me, Marion, if you can't trust me when you have nothing to eat, when you can't, uh, you know, you, you must eat this to be healthy. You have to eat that. You have to take this one. He says, time's going to come. <clears throat> now I could be able to do that. What are you going to do, Ty? Because you don't have, because you're going to have to eat things that <clears throat> perhaps are not good for you. And that may be all you'll have to eat. That's why you must pray over everything with thanksgiving and prayer and faith in believing that he will take it and he will bless it. I can probably go on and on and on to tell you about these miracles isn't to tell you that I'm somebody special. It's not to tell you that. It's to tell you that if you would believe what he says, take it to heart and work with it. You think I didn't have to? People think that miracles fall from the sky. You don't have to work with God. You don't have to overcome anything. Hey, it's okay. You don't have to worry about nothing. God will take care of that. Oh, did I hear that many times. Oh, no, it's, don't you even worry about it. Don't you concern yourself. They couldn't tell me how to overcome it because they didn't know how. The only person I had in my life was Jesus Christ, God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I didn't have anybody else. Like I said, there I am out in the woods and it's pitch black outside. No street light, no moon. And I hear blood curdling screams at the park, not even a mile away. It's like a half a mile, if that. And when you heard it, you knew somebody was being raped and murdered. You knew it. You understood it. Didn't have a telephone. No pastor to call. No friend to say, hey, agree with me. Nothing. None of that. I couldn't even see two feet in front of me. For me to find a safe place to, to sit and pray, I had to do that.
in pitch black outside. And as I sat there, and I've been there and done that before when I've been out there where water moccasins were known to be all around there. Snakes were known to come out at night. <laughs> and in my flesh, I'd have been terrified. But in the spirit, I felt nothing. And all I did was one small prayer. Just one. I didn't pray and beg God to cast out those demons. I didn't even ask God to cast them out. I bound them. I bound their power to continue. I bound their strength to do what they were doing. And instantly, everything stopped. No more screaming. No more nothing. It stopped. And the next day, a policeman who had bought a horse off of us brought a satanic hood. And he was so happy. He said, we caught them all, Marion. We caught them all. We could hardly believe we caught the whole a coven of satanic worshipers. He says, look, here's the hood of the leader. And he pulled it out and showed it to me. I didn't say that I was up all, all night praying because I wasn't. I didn't say that I was doing. I, I didn't say anything except that I rejoiced with him. He was so thrilled that God used him to catch them all. And some will say, but you don't understand. I have witches over here. They're, they surround me. They're in my building. They're here. They're there. I need prayer with you. Would you please? Where do you think I was? Who do you think was with me? I went into a little town in North Carolina and I could not sleep. I could feel something really bad in the spirit. And God would and tell me, don't sleep. I want you to pray. Prayed in a few minutes. And finally, you know, after a couple of days of not knowing what was going on, after he showed me how to pray, boom, it was gone. In seconds, it wasn't, it didn't take 10 hours. And I found out it was a coven of Wicca witches right up the road. A coven of them meant a lot of them gathered together. And they were gone. So when you say, oh, it takes about 18 hours to be delivered of this and how you have to pray and oh you just have to have somebody with you and the two of you together you have to do this and you have to go through that and oh all of these different ritual rituals and lack of understanding or, but see you've been used with deliverances and you're going to come and tell me that you know the word because everything that I have ever said to you, you said, yes, but it says this. Never mind that the Bible called a whore a harlot. He didn't say a nice person. He didn't say a sweet person. He didn't say, and he didn't refrain from what he said. He called it a harlot, which means the same thing. But, oh, you can find fault with that. You might not be able to find fault with anything else that I say, but you'll pick that out because you'll cherry pick because you sit in authority in thinking that you have the word to figure out an anointed person and you're not afraid to touch them. You're not afraid to find fault with them. You're not afraid to play with their soul and say, can you take it? Meaning, can you take correction? <laughs> well, 
when you go through what I've gone through and you're heading for it, I, I guarantee you, you're heading for it. You may not be able to make it through because God says those who call themselves prophets, he says he is coming to visit them. He says, but I'm also coming for those who think they are filled with the Holy Spirit. They think they're casting out demons. They're doing this, this, and this. He says, and I'm coming, and I'm going to magnify myself the way you stood in my presence. And some of them may not live because there is so much knowledge puffs up. They're so sure they have it because they have a combination of the way they think God operates. And they're going to tell everybody and enemy. They, they become, and I'm not talking about one particular person. I'm talking about they. When I say they, I mean they. They actually believe that uh, they, their past feelings, nothing is going. If they could see God come down from heaven like Jesus Christ and be right in front of them, and they won't be the least bit impressed. Because they're positive, they've got it right. Even though they know they're not even delivered of the stuff they need delivered of. It's no clue to them. No clue. They're still doing the things. They can't control it. But oh, they know how to cast out demons. You tell me how. You tell me how you cast out demons when you still have demons. I doubt it. When you still have something beyond your control that manipulates you and uses you and causes you to do what you don't want to do, something is wrong with you. But I, I believe the something that's big time wrong with you is the belief that you have need of nothing. You don't know that you're poor, blind, and naked. You have no idea. Like I said, that little girl in a bikini, that mother that shows everything she owns. They have no idea. Self-deception. The deception of the imagination of your own heart. God has told me from the beginning that is one of man's worst enemies, more than any other person on earth, more than any force or any power could ever, ever cause you trouble or ever take you in the wrong direction. The imagination of your own heart would be the worst. And that's the one you have to tackle. But if you believe you had have, have it all, You'll never try and track, tackle it. You'll never try and bring it up. And you don't even want to hear somebody that can tell you how. Because huh, <laughs> how God must see all this. Well, I heard that. I read that in the Word. And I could tell you some. Because I know this, this, and this. And I know that it matches up to this, this, and that. Yeah. Like the guy that can find scripture to tell you that Jesus got married. He has to take that out of context in order to do that. And yet, you women, you let him do it. He's got thousands of followers. A lot of these people have thousands of people that they listen to. Even though it does them no good, it doesn't lead them to repentance, it doesn't lead them into all truth. They still go, they still go, and they still go, and they still give, and they still give, and they rob their children, they rob their families, they rob their parents, they rob everybody around them that God wants to use them for. They rob them by giving to those that buy and sell the gospel, those that tell them that you must give to get. Mm. even if that were true in the word, even if you could cherry pick it, 
I wouldn't touch it with a ten-foot pole. Lest I fall into something. Because you see, I never want to give one thing to God that I would get it back. I'm not asking for it. I lived a life of nothing else but giving every penny, every moment, every thought, every word, every deed, every prayer, every time, everything was given to others and given to God. And there's going to come a time I'm going to write a book about it because everything I tell you is nothing compared to what I've been through. Everything, there's a thousand videos that are only the tip of the iceberg. There's so much in my life that he will actually bring it out when he wants you to hear it. He wants to help you come out from among them and be ye a separate people. Thus saith the Lord. He wants that desperately because he wants you sanctified. He talks to you constantly about it. He wants you. He wants you to not be discouraged. He wants you to grow up and face it like a man, face it like a woman. Hey, yea, and all who will live godly shall suffer persecution. He wants you to look at that and see that as it is. Not as what you'd like to paint it up about. I'm going to pause here for now. So I'm getting a little bit tired. Ah, it's not that it's late. It's just that after you've ministered and ministered and talked to people and prayed with people, and <laughs> you get just a wee bit tired. And that's okay, because he always gives me rest. And then he always gives me the grace to get back up and do 